tomatoes are my favorite thing to grow. Um, I love to eat them. And of course, those good homegrown to uh, tomatoes cannot be beat. Um, so I have this labeled as spring tomatoes uh, here um, in um, the Houston area. We also have the availability to grow some fall tomatoes. Um, that can be a little more problematic. So there's a few things you do a little bit differently. But today we're going to focus on um, this current growing season, the spring tomatoes. Um, and um, we'll get started. A little history. I, I'm always really interested in food history and how we came to eat what we eat. And so just a bit of that to start. Uh, the tomato is native to the Americas. Uh, we believe it was found growing wild um, in the Andy, um, Andes mountain region, um, Western South America. Then we believe that the uh, first tomatoes began to be cultivated in Mexico and very likely by the Aztec civilization. Um, in the 1500s, uh, due to the early Spanish and Portuguese explorers, we saw uh, the tomato travel to Spain where it was first adopted in Europe um, and it did spread through Southern Europe. Um, not as popular in the north uh, of Europe, but that probably had to do with they didn't really grow very well in the north. Um, and then we saw the cultivation come back uh, to the Americas, arrive with the colonists um, in the 1680s. And it took a long time for people to really accept uh, the tomatoes. Um, as we know and love today, uh, many people, because they are in the nightshade family and many plants in that family are toxic. For the longest time, many people thought tomatoes were poisonous. And it, it, it took a lot of effort uh, by some folks to get people really interested in them. Um, and so um, one thing they do know is that um, a lot of people did get sick. Wealthy people would get sick eating tomatoes, uh, but that's because wealthy people had pewter, had metal, had uh, pewter plates, and the poor people had wooden plates. Well, they didn't have the trouble with the tomato, but it turned out the acidity of a tomato would leach some of uh, the toxins out of um, these metal plates. And so um, that was another little problem. But today we see a world production that's over 160 million tons per year. And it's speculated that there's about 35,000 different tomato varieties. Um, once a good tomato comes to market, it can be very valuable for the grower. And so uh, people are always breeding um, a new color, a new flavor profile, a new shape, um, always working on those new tomatoes. So they're packed with nutrition. There's um, high antioxidants. They're high in vitamins, loaded with minerals. They're also filled with fiber, uh, which really is great for our digestive system. And they are high in water, 94.5% around there. Um, of their weight is from water. So they're really hydrating. It's what makes them so great in the summer. So let's get started. So always uh, keep it organic. Um, we at Urban Harvest do teach organic growing methods and um, it's just obviously better for our environment, uh, better for that soil that uh, we wanna keep rich and healthy. Um, you have a healthy soil, you're gonna have a healthy plant. And of course we're eating our tomatoes and so I kind of like to know I'm putting clean food in my body. So we wanna start with some planning. So you're gonna consider um, whether you're going to plant in a raised bed. Here in the greater Houston area, we have a lot of heavy clay soil. Uh, in fact, it's labeled black gumbo. Um, it's not the greatest soil for um, growing tomatoes here uh, because it, the clay holds too much water in. It doesn't have a lot of nutritive value. Um, tomatoes are heavy feeders. And so it, that's not conducive. So we wanna see a nice raised bed, uh, at least eight inches of good soil. Or you can grow beautifully in a container as well. So consider maybe uh, at least a 10 gallon size um, container and um, you can do fabulous um, with a container and growing tomatoes. So you do want to have really good soil need to consider uh, the light 
needs, how much sunlight. Um, you're gonna need to think about the amendments. As I said, the tomatoes are heavy feeders. So you wanna always um, have good soil amendments on hand, some fertilizers, um, some good compost, things you can add to improve your soil and improve the texture of your soil. Um, and then you're going to uh, need to decide on how you're gonna support those tomato plants. Now, um, we'll get into this in a minute, but some of the tomato varieties get very, very large um, and hopefully very heavy with fruit. So they're gonna need some support. So you're gonna consider either a cage or a stake. So for the cage, a lot of people go to the store and they see those small little cages that are truly designed for peppers, for chili plants, um, because a nice big strong cage really needs to be uh, at least five feet tall. Um, if you're going to do a stake, you need to have that at least eight feet tall. Um, and that will give it the support and keep that because tomatoes are truly vine-like in nature and they would left on their own, uh, would sprawl all over the ground. And it's very important to keep tomatoes um, up off the ground to keep the air circulation to help mitigate some of the disease issues and also for accessibility to the fruit. Um, and so they do need that support. And then it is important to mulch. Mulch does many things, especially here in the heat that we do experience here in Texas. Um, you're going to be helping keep moisture down in that soil. You're going to help keep maybe some weed seeds from germinating. And also very beneficial for tomatoes, you're gonna to help with some splashback, possibly having some soil borne pathogens in that soil. So a nice heavy coating of mulch could help mitigate some of that uh, soil splashback of the pathogens. Um, Sherry, we have a comment in the chat and someone has commented about animals and critters. So you have a nice structure to support the tomatoes. What do you suggest for deterring critters getting your tomatoes? Well, that's that's an ongoing, unanswerable, well, I'll say, <laughs> you can uh, do many things to try and protect. I, at one point, went so far as to have a little electrified fence um, built up, and it was explained to me that I had spent so much money on all my endeavors to keep um, the critters off my tomatoes, even so far as spending the night outside on a cot one evening trying to catch what critter was eating my tomatoes. Uh, but having said that, uh, it was explained to me that all the money I spent, I could have gone to Whole Foods all summer long and bought $6 a pound heirloom tomatoes and come out <laughs> uh, cheaper. Uh, but you truly just um, have to be monitoring. Uh, if you do seem to have a, a critter problem, uh, for me, it's, it's a lot of birds just grow enough to, um, but I'll get into that towards towards the, the end of it, a few little suggestions on protecting for birds and so forth. Uh, but as far as um, other, other rats sometimes will be, um, and uh, raccoons sometimes are interested in the tomatoes, but it's all about maybe providing a few extra plants. Um, there's a small little variety called Matt's Wild Cherry that profusely uh, produces fruit and they're small, tiny little, almost a little berry size, a blueberry size fruits. And I find if I grow that in a couple places around my yard, that's as the sacrificial plant that can help um, keep them off of my, my uh, other tomatoes that I'm, I'm, I'm wanting for my own harvest. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the birds and so forth in a bit. Best soil uh, for growing tomatoes is going to be highly fertile, well-drained, uh, and slightly acidic. And then we want to talk about loamy soil. So it's going to be rich with nutrients. It's going to look very rich with lots of compost. It's going to drain really, really, really well. Um, and, you know, it's going to have a fair amount of, of sand. So if I thought about trying to mix something myself, I would probably do a third topsoil, a third sand, a sharp sand. Um, and uh, so you get a lot of texture there. Um, and then a third of a really high end compost. So that could be a mixture you could put together for your garden soil. 
And tomatoes do, as I mentioned, like a little bit acidic. So somewhere a range of five, eight to seven, uh, which is the neutral point would be good for tomatoes. So here, just to take a look at that, um, on this chart here, it's just talking about what minerals, what elements are available uh, given the um, how basic or acidic your soil is. And um, that's why we want to worry about our pH is because it does affect what's available to your plant. Um, all of these elements need to be um, uh, into uh, the water system as you, you, you water your plants um, and the water, these, these minerals dissolve in the water and that's how they become available to your plant. And so um, because you can see what's available, the top three, um, which is the nitrogen, the phosphorus and the potassium that's considered our macronutrients. They've got a lot of available uh, availability when we start to get a little bit acidic. And then the calcium is pretty important too for tomatoes. So this is just something I really, really liked. Um, everybody uh, thinks of uh, Dr. George Washington Carver and all the work he did with peanuts and sweet potatoes, but he actually did a lot of work with tomatoes. He particularly loved tomatoes. He actually wrote a, a pretty large agricultural pamphlet all about tomatoes. Um, and it has something of, like about 115 tomato recipes. He was a pretty simple man. So some of them are just squeezing the tomatoes over noodles, you know, things like that. But it's, it's a great read. Um, and this was his um, recipe uh, for making a good compost. So it's two loads of leaves from the forest and muck from the swamp. And you spread that over the bottom of a pen. And then you load in um, a big scoop of barnyard manure. And you continue with this until your pin is full and round it over the top like a potato hill. Um, and then this is to prevent the excess of water from washing out the fertilizing constituents. To this, you add heaps of old rags, plaster, lime, paper, wood ashes, finely beaten up bones. Um, and this is how he loved to make compost. And I, I, I really, um, laugh at the beaten up bones. So I don't have access to that. <laughs> but this just gives you an idea of all the good nutrients um, tomatoes would enjoy. So now for a container, just be sure don't, don't use a garden uh, soil. You wanna use a high quality potting mix. Um, you want to make sure that it's a light designed for a container because your uh, regular garden soils can become too heavy and too compacted in a container. Typically we're watering uh, a container a lot more because they drain so well and that could tend over time to really compact your soil. So just invest um, that old adage of don't put a $10 plant in a dollar hole really runs true for tomatoes. Invest in that soil. And then for the amount of light, tomatoes really need six to eight hours of full sun each day. Um, the perfect scenario, particularly here in Houston where we tend to keep, keep get some brutal heat um, early on sometimes in April, uh, you want full morning sun with maybe a little bit of late afternoon shade. That would be ideal. So now you're gonna consider what to plant. Are you gonna start from seed? Uh, that certainly gives you great choices and varieties. There's some wonderful seed companies out there that, that offer some wonderful varieties of tomatoes uh, that's fun to play with. Um, or are you gonna start with a transplant? Certainly, uh, if you're starting with a seed, you're gonna to need to start uh, growing that plant indoors six to eight weeks before um, your last frost. Um, and so um, that can take a little more time uh, to plan for uh, or start with a nice healthy transplant. Um, 
then the varieties. So their growth habits. So tomatoes come in two forms, determinate. So those are going to be things, uh, they might be labeled as a patio tomato. Or a lot of your Roma tomatoes styles are, are determinate. That means it's going to grow to a certain size, usually no more than about four feet. Um, they're going to put all their fruit on pretty much at the same time. And it's all going to mature at pretty close to the same time. And then it's kind of done. Um, and then there are the indeterminate varieties. And these plants will continue to grow and will continue to produce fruit over a long season, as long as you are managing to keep that plant healthy. Um, and these are the very large, they certainly take a lot more room. Uh, so the determinate um, really work great if you have a small space, maybe you just have an apartment with a, um, a balcony. So maybe think about growing uh, a patio variety in that situation. Um, you might want to consider the days of uh, to maturity. And that can be confusing for people sometimes, but it most commonly means from the moment you get that, that plant in the soil, down in that container or in your raised bed. Um, and um, that's going to uh, really be indicative of that fruit size. Are you growing a very large variety? Certainly it's going to need longer to um, become ready for harvest than a small cherry uh, or current size tomato. And sometimes you want to think about that if you're getting your tomatoes in a little bit later than is recommended for your area, maybe you, you need to strive to, to uh, get a faster harvest with, harvest with a smaller variety of tomato. And then you're going to see things labeled as a hybrid, possibly, or an heirloom. So um, let's move to my next slide here. So heirloom tomatoes are strains that have been reproduced for generations without crossbreeding and are open pollinated. So you're going to see so many colors, um, purples, dark, dark purples, uh, so red, they're so purple. Uh, greens, they ripen green, uh, yellows, almost some white ones, pink ones, just a lot of variety. Um, and um, they tend to have a lot of flavor. Remember, people were saving these seeds and sharing these seeds uh, with family, with um, the villagers, um, and keeping them because they probably had a really, really good flavor, or maybe they were really great producers, or perhaps they were a little more disease resistant. But for whatever reason, they were great tomatoes, and people saved those seeds. Then we look at the modern tomato that you're going to find most often in your um, grocery store are the hybrid tomatoes. So these have been bred uh, for size, for certain shapes, um, for shipping. So we want to think about the um, store tomato that's going to be that perfectly round tomato. It's going to have a little tougher skin. It's going to be bred so it holds well on the shelf and that it ships well. And they kind of forgot sometimes to breed in some of that flavor. So um, that's why a lot of people um, really love the heirlooms. They can be a little trickier to grow at times because they don't have some of those disease resistance bred into them like the hybrid tomatoes. So if you're just wanting to start growing, you've never grown tomatoes first, you might want to start with a really well-producing um, hybrid tomato. Uh, there's some of a variety called Celebrity that grows very consistently well here and it's got good disease resistance bred into it. So then you can also choose for the different sizes. There's some that are currants. They're actually little current size. Our cherry size being a little bit larger. Uh, the grape shaped tomatoes, uh, pear, um, then the, we think about salad tomatoes, they're going to be the, the smaller to more medium sized um, tomatoes. Then certainly there's uh, the paste tomatoes. Those are tomato varieties that have a thicker uh, wall. So there's actually more tomato meat and less seeds inside. So if you're uh, wanting to grow tomatoes to, to make um, you know, a tomato sauce, tomato gravy, that sort of thing, you might consider growing a, a paste variety. And then, of course, the slicers, um, what everyone wants to go out and grab that giant, gorgeous tomato to slice to put on that hamburger. So just a few planting tips. So you want to plant appropriate varieties. So consider your space, uh, how much room you have, uh, and, you know, what, what is your use? What do you most 
make fresh salads? Do you need some slicers? Do you want those paste tomatoes? So think about those things when choosing. You wanna choose the right place. Again, you need to be able to have a nice, well-drained environment with rich, healthy soil in the sun because that is a stress factor. If a plant is not getting enough sun, it's gonna be stressed. Therefore, it's gonna be more um, uh, susceptible to diseases and pest um, problems. You want to make sure when you, if you're buying transplants that you're buying good, healthy plants that don't already come with disease issues. Um, I do this, feel free, look at a plant, take it out of the container carefully, uh, look at the root system, they should be nice and white. Um, and so uh, really check out that little plant before you bring it home. And then very importantly is to plant at the right time. Now here in the, the Houston area, we actually have to put our tomatoes in quite early. Uh, we put them in, we start thinking about towards the second week of February, uh, even though we're going to probably get some, some temperatures that are not favorable, but we have to put them in and protect them because we get, too hot sometimes in April for them to set fruit. So we kind of have to fool the weather system by getting our tomatoes in early, protecting them uh, from the cold and from the wind. And that way they'll go ahead and grow and put lots of fruit on. And then when we get those high um, temperatures above 95, uh, they will go ahead and ripen the fruit that they have already set. Um, so that's, one thing to consider planting at the right time. So um, you're getting ready to plant. You're gonna think about preparing that soil. So if you already have an existing garden bed, uh, go out there and make sure you've got all the weeds cleaned out. Uh, make sure that maybe go ahead and, and, and put down, um, broadcast uh, a nice granular organic fertilizer and work that into your soil. Uh, perhaps uh, think about uh, if you've had an area where you've had some fungal disease issues, maybe think about using a bit of uh, organic um, fungicide to, to, to maybe knock some of that, some of those fungal spores down before you get started. You, then we talked about the adding the amendments. So I, I talked about adding some fertilizer, uh, maybe go ahead and top off, give yourself a good two or three inches of a nice, good compost. That's gonna be adding nutrients back to that soil, giving a little more life and, and nutritive value to that soil. Um, and then now it's time to plant. So when you are, uh, planting, you want to consider um, a tomato is a little bit different than anything else I can think in the way that you plant it. Typically with a transplant, you're not going to go deeper uh, than it already sits in the soil, but a tomato um, is very different. In fact, you will plant it very deeply. Uh, a tomato, if you've ever looked at a little tomato plant, they have little hair-like structures all up and down um, the stem, the main lead uh, stem, and those have the potential to turn into roots. So you'd want to dig a very deep hole. You want to pinch off any of the leaves that will be down under the soil and place that in a deep hole and bring the soil up around. Uh, and so um, then you're going to develop roots. A large root system is going to be very beneficial in enable that plant to take up certainly more water and more nutrients further reach down into the soil. Of course, better stability when you have that large plant with all that fruit on it. Um, and so you just wanna encourage that large, large root system and um, get that plant deeply. Now you could also do, uh, lay it, if you have a long, tall, leggy plant, so maybe you're getting a transplant that's been in a little uh, container a little bit too long, maybe it's been in a greenhouse, reaching for sun, um, and it's very tall and leggy, you could actually trench that tomato plant. So basically you would dig a long trench and gently lay the tomato plant on its side, barely working the top orienting it up towards the top of the hole and then bury that. And that's a really good way to plant um, a tomato plant that's tall and leggy. 
Okay. And then you're going to water very deeply. Make sure that um, you've really saturated the soil. Place your finger down in there. You should have a, at least two inches of moisture. Um, often you, you think you've watered a lot and it really hasn't uh, been as much as that plant could uh, use. And then you're gonna to want to protect it. So whether if you're staking it, you would have put your stake in the ground before you planted your transplant and plant your transplant right up against the stake. Um, if you're using a cage, um, you're then at this point, you've got your plant planted, it's watered. Um, go ahead and put some mulch on it. Um, sometimes here, uh, we don't mulch right away um, because we want the soil to warm up. So we'll give it a week or two to let that soil warm up. And then we'll go ahead and come back with the mulch, but that's just weather dependent. Okay, and then so with protecting it, um, what we do uh, with the cage is we'll go ahead and wrap it with some frost cloth. Um, a and likes uh, suggest the uh, row cover material that you can buy. It's actually thinner, thinner and more gauzy and it, it lets a little more light in. Uh, but basically you're looking to protect it. Anything below 50 degrees is gonna be damaging to the tomato. Might not be something real obvious, but it could um, deter that plant to uh, really growing to its best potential. Uh, and so we wanna put that around it, and the other thing you can do um, is actually fill a gallon jug of water, place that down inside the cage um, that's wrapped, and that's going to warm up during the day and act like a little solar heater and emit just enough uh, warmth at night to hopefully protect that tomato. And then if we're truly going to get it down in the 30s, because I personally got my tomatoes in the last uh, week of February and we we did get into some nights that were in the 30s so I went out and I actually wrapped more frost cloth and covered the top of my cage as well and that 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 worked really well for my tomatoes uh, to really protect them so um, from that cold so your ideal temperatures uh, are going to be between 70 and 75 very few days like that in Houston. Um, some of you folks living uh, from our friends in, in New York and Pennsylvania, you, you have more opportunity to hit those, <laughs> get those degrees. Uh, the nighttime pollination is gonna be best at 55 to 70 degrees and day pollination is less than 85 degrees. So that's really important. Tomatoes are, are what we consider self-pollinating. So they depend on the pollen to drop from flower to flower. So very problematic in the Houston Gulf Coast area with temperatures that reach above 85 24 seven, which we can sometimes hit that in, in, in April, um, they don't pollinate very well. So you're gonna have blossom drop. Uh, they won't set fruit. So one thing that you can help uh, this mitigate this issue with is you can thump your tomato flowers, your little blossoms. That's going to help jiggle some of that pollen loose. Uh, sometimes that afternoon shade we talked about can help with this issue. Uh, you can take a little paintbrush and tickle each little flower. Basically, you're you're playing pollinator yourself, and that that can help uh, set your fruit as well. But um, again, when we talked about getting them in at the right time, and that's why we put our tomatoes in in February, ideally, and protect them from the cold that we do have so that we do get good fruit set. So uh, you wanna water those tomatoes, at least uh, one to three inches a week. And that's certainly gonna depend on your, your temperature. Um, the real key is just consistency in that watering. Come up with a program. Um, ideally, uh, a drip system works very well uh, because you're wanting to hydrate down at the roots. Again, we have a lot of problems with fungal diseases on tomatoes. So when you and those spores uh, sit on those tomato leaves, um, they can splash out from the soil. They can be blowing in uh, with the wind. Um, insects can bring in um, diseases as well. But uh, keeping the water off the leaves. So when you're watering that tomato, just a good soak around the base. Um, and in the morning, um, that's when we're having a little bit cooler temperatures. You're wanting uh, to really hydrate that plant for the day. Give it that good drink of water. 
Um, and uh, it's gonna be, um, remember those tomatoes have high water content. So you're gonna really need to give it um, the water that it needs to keep that fruit happy. And then to fertilize, I do uh, fertilize when you plant or transplant, uh, put a, a, about a, a cup and really mix it in. Uh, I use a, an organic granular fertilizer that's slow release uh, because you, some of the, the chemical fertilizers can really burn a plant. So you wanna be really careful, read your, your labels um, and put the proper amount in. And you wanna stir that in um, again, because sometimes the, uh, you can see some burning from fertilizer, particularly with the, the chemical fertilizers. Um, and then once it's growing and once it starts to put on the, your flowers, um, I like to foliar feed. So I get a really good um, organic uh, liquid concentrate. Um, one I like to use, um, we have one that's made of all kinds of seaweed and um, things of, of that nature. I think it's called ocean harvest or something, but um, it's good. Uh, you can mix that up. It's concentrated. You can either do a soil drench, uh, really drench the soil around the plant or a foliar feed where you actually put it in a, a sprayer and you can spray your leaves and um, the plant has the ability to absorb the nutrients. And I find particularly uh, here in the heat that we have in the Houston area, you're watering a little more than maybe you folks would um, up north. Um, and that really helps keep them going because you're really giving them that extra pump of nutrients that really revitalizes them. Um, and I do that about every two weeks. If you're just staying with the granular, granular fertilizer, you can go in and side dress. So that would be just working it around the base of the plant um, uh, about every four weeks. So uh, when we take a look at um, feeding your tomatoes, there's a lot of the different products. Um, my picture here, I just have a particular favorite of ours is MicroLife. It's actually produced here in the Houston area. And it's a great um, fertilizer that is a, they, they do a lot of granular uh, as well as a lot of liquid fertilizers. And so um, again, the macro, nutrients that you have uh, are gonna be the nitrogen. Nitrogen is gonna encourage your uh, good growth, the leaf growth. Um, and be careful though, after your, if you just have a huge tomato plant with lots of green leaves, you're not gonna have as much fruit. You don't want the plant putting all its energy into growing leaves. So be careful with the nitrogen. Um, and then the phosphorus. So when you see the three numbers on all fertilizers, the first number is going to be your nitrogen. Um, and your second number is going to be your phosphorus. And phosphorus is going to encourage the flowering and of, then, of course, the fruiting. Um, that's what you want on your tomatoes. Um, and then the third number is going to represent the ratio of the potassium. And potassium helps uh, with the overall ability of the plant to be healthy and grow and take up water from the soil. Um, and it, it does help encourage a uh, good, strong uh, root growth and root activity. So and then there's pruning and some people say don't prune, some people prune heavily, really just depends on how much space you have, uh, you know, how uh, contained do you need to keep those plants? Um, also, if you're putting them a little closer together, recommended uh, three to four feet apart. Um, if you're growing them a little closer, you might want to prune a little more heavily because what you're wanting to achieve is good air circulation. So you need that airflow. And if you've got huge plants with tons of excess leaves, um, you're not going to get as good of air circulation. So, you know, prune to help keep the plants compact, you know, they're easier to stake. It's certainly easier to access the fruit. You're gonna have that airflow. Um, and then if you're removing um, the lower leaves, uh, you're gonna have less of that soil borne um, disease pressure, the splash up from the soil possibly. I usually bring up, um, I take off all the leaves as my plant grows. Um, and so there won't be any leaves closer than about a foot off of the ground. Um, but 
the downside to pruning is if that's that fruit is exposed it could potentially get sun scald um, then the fruit is more visible to our little bird friends and, and also the pest uh, pressures that we have and what are the leaves for? Well, that's, they're the little factories uh, for photosynthesis to, to create um, the sugars for the plant, the food for the plant. So the less leaves they have, the less their ability to photosynthesize is. So you just have to find a delicate balance and look at your space. Um, some people, like I said, prune very heavily. They'll only have two main lead stems coming up. So when you talk about pruning, um, some people all always take off what we call the sucker. So I don't know if you can see, can you see this little tomato plant? Anybody, can you see it? Sorry about that, a, a little Hello? slow on the draw and then muting. But yes, we can see the plant. Hi, Sherry, oh, okay. we can see the plant. So, uh, oh, okay, so there's little leaf structures and they're called the suckers. And where you have a Y, two stems going off in sort of a Y shape, you will have little leaf structures grow those uh, right in that little Y section. And those are called the suckers. So that's one good way to think about just pruning. Just, just, just take off all the little suckers. Get them when they're real small. That way you can just use your fingers and just pinch them off. And that's a good way to take off those excess leaves uh, to, to allow some of that airflow, but still leave the good sun factories there um, and good fruit coverage um, for your plant too. And then of course, I do recommend bringing up about a foot off the ground as well. Okay. So now we wanna think about when it's time to harvest. Well, you can harvest a tomato when it's about 20 to 30% blushed out. So when you first start to see that color, now that's one way to mitigate the bird issue. The bird's coming in for that bright red or bright yellow tomato uh, because they pretty much leave your green tomatoes alone. Um, and so when it starts to blush out, it's actually mature as far as when you're thinking about the seed maturity. After all, the tomato is just a fleshy fruit housing the seeds for that plant, okay? But uh, those seeds are already mature when you start to see the, the tomato blushing. Just bring it inside. Do never, never, never refrigerate a tomato. Keep it in at room temperature and it will continue to ripen uh, all the way. Tomatoes, uh, basically I'm showing you this little, I have with the arrow and it says the abstention zone or the knuckle. So that's called the little knuckle. When that tomato starts to blush out, that knuckle is almost like a little valve and it actually starts to close off from the rest of the plant. So that plant is self-regulating. It is saying, I've already matured my seeds and I'm not going to feed that tomato anymore. I'm not going to be sending nutrients to that tomato anymore. It's going to send its energy somewhere else. Okay. So at that point, leaving it on the vine, you're exposing it to the risk of the pests. You're um, really not going to get any more flavor at all out of it. So go ahead and harvest it and bring it inside and leave it at room temperature till it fully ripens and you're good to go. Right, so now let's just take a look at some of the diseases. So you always want to anticipate. So you want to know it's going to come. We're going to have some disease issues, probably. Uh, monitor. I go out and inspect my tomatoes almost every morning. Want to check. I'm starting to look for signs, early signs. It's always easy to start taking care of something when you very first all see a problem uh, instead of trying to solve a problem when it's well out of hand. And then learn to identify. So you wanna know what some of these diseases look like so you can take care of it. You wanna know um, as soon as you can. So, we'll, um, so some of the ways that you can prevent some disease issues is crop rotation. It is said ideally that you would only plant a tomato in the same space once every four years. 
Uh, we talk about a lot of the fungal issues. About 97% of plant disease is fungal in nature. And those little spores can sit around in your soil for quite some time. So um, rotating it is a good way. I don't have that luxury in my yard. And I, as I said, I love tomatoes. I love to grow tomatoes. So I just come in every season before I plant my tomatoes anew. And I top off with a good three or four inches of a good heavy compost and then use mulch um, quite freely as well. Uh, so, but keep your soil improved, improve, improve your soil, add those amendments. A healthy soil will produce a healthy plant. A healthy plant will not be as susceptible to your disease and pest pressures. Um, so keeping that soil healthy is vital. Buying good quality soil is vital. And then the proper watering, you know, any, any issues we can have overwatering or underwatering uh, is really gonna affect the plant health as well. You're going to destroy infected plants, throw them in the trash can, dispose of them properly. Never put tomato plants ever in your compost piles um, because they do have the disease issues. Even if you're not physically seeing it, there, there's, prob there's probably something there. Always dispose of anything when you're, you're, you're trimming and pruning back. Always cut back um, any of the, the leaves that are starting to look like they have a problem and take them away, take them out of the area. Any of the leaves that look like they have disease issues that fall to the ground, take them away, dispose of them, okay? And then um, one way is avoid planting tomatoes in the shade. Again, that's gonna be a stress factor and you want to give it the full sun that it needs to be that healthy plant. Um, and then the nuclear option, if you really have a lot of problems uh, with certain diseases is what we would call solarizing the soil. That is basically covering the whole entire bed, the whole area, um, planting area with a, a, a heavy plastic and keeping it in place and letting the sun cook your soil. Now you're completely killing everything, all the good microbes, the hundreds of thousands of creatures that live in that soil that are the good bacteria, the good fungus, you're killing all of that. So you're actually going to have to start completely over uh, and um, inoculate your soil with good mycorrhizal fungi and all kinds of wonderful things if you go to this method. But sometimes it's your, your only way uh, to totally get an area uh, disease-free to start. So uh, when you're buying, especially those hybrid tomatoes, um, you can look at your label. Uh, your little culture label uh, that'll tell you what the variety is and it'll tell you the information you need about growing that. But you might see these little uh, letters. Well, that's giving you the information that this plant has been bred with these uh, resistant. Okay, so if you see the V, the F, the N, so vertriculum wilt, fusarium wilt, nematodes can be a big problem. And so look for these letters on your label. And that's gonna tell you that that's, that's a plant that's bred with a lot of disease resistance. So just a word about applying fungicides. Certainly um, if you've had a history of fungal diseases, you might wanna start spraying a uh, program before um, you plant your plants. Um, and then once after you uh, get your little transplant in the ground um, and you know, that's just beginning before those symptoms appear. You want to really heavily spray the upper and the lower leaves, making sure I just take one of the, the chemical spray cans. I use a, a gallon, follow the label uh, very carefully because you don't want these. These are usually in a, a concentrate and you want to have the, the right ratio. Um, even organic fungicides, they're starting to worry about our honeybee population. Uh, because it does seem they're starting to worry that that even organic fungicides um, have been a problem for our honeybees. Honeybees actually make something called bee bread and they actually have a natural fungus in their um, hives and they feel like that is maybe a problem with them producing bee bread. So spray early in the morning when there's less uh, of the, the little bee friends out there in your garden and really coat your plant well. If it rains, you're gonna to have to reapply it, but you wanna to think to be on a seven to 14 day interval, just depending on, on the severity um, of your issue, or if you've had 
we've had those long rainy uh, weeks, maybe sometimes we, we, we get into two weeks of just dreary rainy days, you might want to think about spraying it each week at that point. So just to look at some of those fungal diseases, um, early blight is one that we experience uh, most commonly here in the Houston area. Again, we have the high humidity uh, and we really invite these, these fungal spores. Um, so early blight, you're gonna start to see a yellowing and you're start to see the little round necrotics, the little dead spots uh, on your leaves. Um, you can start to use um, a fungicide and start pruning and removing all those leaves that appear to have um, the fungus on them. And again, watch that watering, don't splash those leaves. You're splashing those leaves, you're splashing fungal spores about. 